Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christy Koenig, and I serve as the EMS Medical Director for the County of San Diego. Thank you so much for joining us for the next lecture in our series of evidence-based medicine presentations. Today, we are pleased to welcome our very own Dr. Dave Duncan, who will present a talk he prepared specially for us entitled California EMS, a Historical Perspective and Emerging Challenges for the Future. Dr. Duncan has held numerous leadership roles, including EMS Medical Director for CalSTAR Air Ambulance and REACH Air Ambulance and for Cal Fire. He currently serves as the San Diego County Fire Medical Director and a subject matter expert for the County of San Diego EMS office. Immediately prior to accepting his position in San Diego, Dr. Duncan was the governor appointed director of the EMS Authority or EMSA. He led the state office from 1999 to 2021 and was the last person in that position while the law still required the director of EMSA to be a physician. As EMSA director, Dr. Duncan was the final authority in approving our local optional scopes of practice among many, many other roles. He has the unique perspective to view things from both the state and the local levels. We're so thrilled to welcome such a highly qualified speaker today to share knowledge with us on this interesting topic. Thank you so much and over to you, Dave. Thank you, Dr. K. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen here. There's an awful lot of screens flaring at me here. Okay, I think we got it. And does that appear reasonably clear? I see Johnny Gage, so I think we're good. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, excited to be here and give this, you know, tremendously exciting talk on, on history. I'm kind of flashing back to high school and, you know, hoping it's better than, than maybe one of my history professors did. But, uh, you know, we shall see. I, I got plenty of coffee on board. So let, let me let me dive in. Uh, in all honesty, I didn't used to be that interested in EMS history, just wanted to kind of do EMS. But taking that slot in the um, EMS authority uh, really brought a lot of this to light. And, and it's interesting to see how EMS was formed. And I'm going to coin the term that we'll see maybe once or twice through the talk. But if you've seen one EMS system, You've seen one EMS system, right? So th this, I think, gleans some perspective as to why that is the case and why everything is so different in EMS. And maybe, you know, there's so many similarities in law enforcement and fire, but so many uh, dissimilarities, if there's such a word, in, in EMS. So with, with that, uh, I'm going to dive in and, and hopefully show you some of the things nationally and statewide that um, ended up forming what we're all what we're all doing. Uh, there were inklings of EMS clear back to the uh, 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, it began to formulate itself in more and more organized fashion as the years came along. Uh, I'm going to divide the talk into a few of those different uh, sections. Humble beginnings, bold experiments, ALS before BLS, and, and the like. And then down towards the bottom, we'll, we'll sort of see where we are now uh, in California. So first, you know, everybody's heard these varied approaches to EMS. And I think maybe Napoleon was the first one where they talk about attributing ambulances with horse-drawn ambulances on the battlefield, brought ammunition there, removed injured uh, folks uh, with the same, uh, same apparatus, uh, ambulance unloaded. Uh, also, interestingly, air ambulances attributed to Napoleon with uh, with uh, hot air balloons. I I've not seen any real evidence of that, but uh, but you'll see that one pop up as well. Uh, in London, 1832, they had horse-drawn ambulances in urban settings. Uh, we see them. Uh, there's some stories of them bringing uh, uh, pregnant females to physicians for deliveries and the like, but uh, largely it was just trying to transport folks to a, to a physician. Uh, we start getting a little more organized as time goes on. Bellevue Hospital, New York City, 
late 1800s had some semblance of ambulances. Um, I don't know what the stomach pump looked like. The brandy makes good sense to all of us. Um, when we got into wars, uh, we started seeing more and more organization for EMS, and that's really a whole different talk. But uh, what's interesting is we learn a lot about pre-hospital care during wars, and then we forget it all. And there's interesting sort of survival graphs of uh, even on the civilian side following a war, World War One, World War II, Vietnam, and then that uh, survival kind of falling off as we forget what we learned and there were uh, prominent attempts to retain all that knowledge after the last several wars that we've seen through the 90s and the 2000s. But Viet Vietnam is attributed largely for bringing EMS to bear as we see it currently. Uh, it was often reported that those wounded in combat actually had a better chance of survival in Vietnam than those getting into car accidents in the U.S. That was a quote that stuck and started paving the way for more organized uh, pre-hospital systems. Now, also, the medics returning from Vietnam uh, brought an advanced skill set to bear. Their training and experience contributed largely to helping build the EMS systems of the predominantly mid and late 60s. Uh, the responders prior to that were largely uh, funeral home workers who simply uh, drove the only vehicle that could transport a supine patient, uh, and they maybe figured out some things to do. But uh, Vietnam was a big one, uh, bringing to bear what we do today. Uh, then, and and probably still now to a significant degree, the, the victim's best chance was a fast ride to the hospital, to a, a physician and, and a, an organized system of care. Um, when we start seeing more formal EMS, uh, we see a lot of big cities come to bear, Seattle, Los Angeles. Uh, we'll see a few of those cited here in a minute. Uh, this kind of caught my eye, this state-of-the-art art back pressure arm lift method of artificial respiration was utilized kind of in the mid 1900s. And, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna just try this and see if we can show you what this is because we may want to get a local optional scope of practice. Just, just saying, you know, hopefully you can hear this. So the gent that developed this artificial respiration was named Holger Nelson, and, and apparently it, it works. Uh, I'm just going to flash forward to a few more seconds uh, showing you, you how to do this in case you want to implement it in your systems. Okay, there, there you have it, right? I, I'm gonna do this tomorrow if something happens bad in, in a restaurant, but I just wanted to sort of bring that to bear and show you all the progress we've made. Pr pretty remarkable. Other interventions that, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the video where the DOD is demonstrating how to do surgical cracks and they put all kinds of odd things in the airway like like keys and pens and, and awful things. And that video kind of reminds me of that video, but uh, more to come there and I'll provide a link if anybody's interested. Moving on, more organized fashion. In the 50s, we developed radio dispatch ambulance staffed by a driver and physician in some cases. Again, often staffed by funeral home employees. That continued uh, largely into the 60s. Um, here's where I think we set a, a huge stage uh, for the development of EMS. This landmark paper 
if if we don't remember anything else from the history of EMS, this is probably a good one. Uh, published in 1966, uh, Accidental Death and Disability, the Neglected Disease of Modern Society was a 37-page report published by National Academy of Sciences, really shed a new light on trauma and brought to bear largely uh, automobile accidents and safety needs within uh, the automobile industry, sort of paved the way for something more than just a lap belt. And uh, many of us probably recall most cars didn't have any anything really in the way of safety, non-collapsible steering columns, uh, rigid, which created uh, extremely severe trauma to head and chest. Uh, dashboards were uh, essentially a, a chunk of steel that would catch people right in the middle of the face or the forehead. Uh, all we had were lap belts, no shoulder belts. Of course, there were no airbags at the time. Uh, you may remember that the Chevy Corvair was was the first um, sort of branded vehicle, the, the epitome of um, danger called unsafe at any speed. Uh, Ralph Nader, I think, uh, led the charge on, on automobile safety. Um, I remember in residency when, well, airbags had been there. Don't, don't get me wrong. I wasn't pre-airbag. But what we did have was uh, we frequently had just driver side airbags. And I think it was my first month uh, in the ED. And uh, a heck of a uh, retrospective study, but uh, older couple launches large vehicle off an overpass into concrete below a uh, male driver essentially unscathed bruised uh, female wife was just just as dead as you could be uh, really demonstrated uh, the immense and, and amazing safety that an airbag offered and shortly after uh, we began to see uh, you know both driver and passenger airbags come into play lots and lots of life saved along with them um, shoulder belts. So this paper, uh, worthy of a review, I think the amazing thing about it is when you read it, it really sort of uh, begs and highlights the pieces that we all prioritize in, in our delivery of trauma in our systems uh, still to this day. Uh, in 90-something, uh, this gent, uh, 97, Ricardo Martinez, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, Administrator relaunched that paper because it was still so pertinent, uh, re reprinted it, kind of tried to rebrand it in the late 90s and, and still pertinent to this day. Let's take a step back and see where EMS began to develop in, in our state largely. So in the 60s, you know, post-Vietnam, we see CPR, we see defibrillation, pharmaceuticals brought to bear in the field to some degree. Uh, we started to see research and practice centered around pre-hospital care. Uh, and we started to see standards in pre-hospital uh, medication delivery, ambulance design, size equipment. Here's a couple of pictures of some of the early defibs. This was uh, touted as, as one of the earliest defibrillate, defibrillators that was uh, hospital-based. It, it actually worked on a couple of patients in the 40s. Um, 50s, we had a, a physician in Ireland, uh, often credited with the first EMS system, uh, developed a uh, the first portable defibrillator, and then we get into something that might begin to appear uh, recognizable to us, the Life Pack 33. I'd ask the question, but no one can probably answer, why do they call it the Life Pack 33? And that's because it weighed, yes, 33 pounds. Uh, that was late 60s, 70s. We started seeing something that looks more like uh, what we were doing. So 69, we saw the first paramedics come to bear in California. Uh, here we have a paramedic class from Los Angeles. And that just uh, prefaced uh, the law, set the stage for some big laws to make their way uh, and, and support paramedic practice uh, just one year later. See that in just a second. So here again in 1970, late 60s, oxygen suction. This, this starts to look a lot like what we do now. Oxygen suction, resuscitators are just sort of breathing machines. It's essentially a CPAP that you put on the patient and push a button when you want to breathe for them. Uh, 
PPE trained paramedics. Again, some more defibrillators here. By the end of 1970, ALS paramedics operating in several large cities, Miami, Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, Columbus, the National Reg Registry of EMTs was founded. First National Registry exam was administered in 71. And then coincidentally, uh, we were on par on the physician side with the first emergency medicine residency starting in Cincinnati in, in 1970. Uh, this is another huge landmark, believe it or not. This this used to kind of catch me sideways, and and I'd shake my head and say, "No, come on." But really, uh, this is a much bigger deal than one would would guess at first glance. When um, the TV show Emergency came out, uh, I won't tell you how old I was, ten years old, but uh, you know, we we'd watch this thing and be amazed by the things they would do in the field and the folks, that, well, of course, everybody survived, right? They saved everyone. And that set the stage for the public, not only in California, not only in the US, but worldwide. Why are our loved ones dying in the field? Look, you can, you can save everybody if you simply do what they're doing. So lots of political pressure came to be from the show Emergency, it ran from 72, I think, to 78. We had Johnny and Roy and Station 51, and, you know, we'll all remember D5W. I think I was 10. I was wondering why they didn't give normal saline or whole blood or something better. But, you know, it was, it was D5W. That's what we had, I guess. Um, now we had legal following for the formal development and uh, oversight, guidance, legal requirements for EMS. Uh, first in California, this actually came before a federal law that follows. So the Wedworth Townsend Act, the EMS Act uh, of 1970 for California, now just hit the 50 year mark, uh, was a typical bill. Uh, the folks in LA got their toe in the door with this bill is the way I would put it. Uh, it, it really is centered around allowing that recent paramedic class that they had to, to be able to practice paramedicine pre-hospital. And you can see with the language here that they just did whatever they could to crack this open with any hospital operated by or con contracting with a county with a population of over 6 million. We know how many of, of those there are, right? So it was Los Angeles got this law kicked open. The interesting part of this law is it's changed several times, but this language still holds uh, in current statute. And this language, interestingly, was mentioned just in the pre-meeting uh, an hour ago uh, for one of the reasons we can't necessarily deliver vaccinations perpetually by our pre-hospital personnel because they can only practice at the scene of an emergency and during transport to a hospital while in the hospital emergency department and until care responsibility is assumed by the regular hospital staff. So that, that continues to live uh, in, that, in that statute. There were many obstacles very similar to what we see or what we saw with 1544 and community paramedicine. Uh, the same players seem to still be involved. Uh, California Medical Association, nurses, I don't know if it was CNA then or not, Hospitals, I don't know if it was CHA then or not, but uh, I'm getting actually a little PTSD looking at this list in, in 1544. But basically everybody pushed back on this because it was change and, and we we hate two things. We hate the status quo and we, we hate change. So the, the interesting part here, California Ambulance Association opposed this, and I'm not sure why. That's probably hiding in the coffers of, of their history, and I'd, I'd like to find out why that was. Um, known as the Wedworth Townsend Paramedic Act, uh, away they go. Uh, there was a revision in 72, and that's the beauty of, you know, getting your toe in the door is you can largely, as we've done in community paramedicine, extrapolate the bill the next time around. Um, in 72, it was, was renewed for another two years. The term any hospital changed to any county, and the requirement for that large population of over 6 million was removed making EMS available to all the counties uh, in, in California. Uh, the feds followed suit 73, 74, the Federal EMS Act. 
this this ends up explaining why California looks like it does with EMS and the LEMSAs and EMSA. Uh, Congress enacted this act and they appropriated $180 million to develop uh, EMS systems. And, and you'll see that this 1973, interestingly, right on the coattails of the 1972 opener for the show Emergency. So, you know, Hollywood certainly has their leverage in, in the politics of what we do. We, we all know that. Uh, they developed program guidelines, appointed a trauma surgeon to lead the federal program, and, and away we went. Uh, they identified 300 EMS regions nationally, provided funds for various things, staff functions, EMS bureaucracies, administration. You could use the funding for other things, but not directly for patient care. But but herein is, is how we ended up where we are in California. They identified 300 EMS systems. And um, let me just see if, yeah, here we go. So... Largely, it was targeting states and to develop state administrations for EMS. Many states adopted EMS from a statewide level. But in California, we had many counties that had already developed EMS systems and had some coordination and some funding. So they wanted to be part of these systems sort of uh, unto themselves uh, and not necessarily falling under the auspices of the, the, the state. The EMSA wasn't wasn't uh, aligned yet, but they didn't necessarily want control and oversight by the state, given they were already doing this well. And, uh, you know, that hasn't changed either, right? Counties want to do what counties want to do, uh, despite what state oversight may or may not uh, direct, just the way it is. Uh, but this is the way it started, interestingly. So they got their own funding. Uh, these sophisticated or, or developed EMS systems got funding and were part of those 300 sections uh, that, that got funding. Hence, the county-centric uh, uh, model for EMS in California was was really born. There was state funding aligned at that time, but um, unfortunately, the state wasn't very excited about EMS. So an EMS section was developed under uh, first... Uh, Governor Brown administration, uh, Department of Healthcare Services, sorry, DHS was Department of Health Services at that time, appointed a pharmacist to head the EMS section, again, demonstrating, uh, you know, let's just make this happen and let's not get too excited about it. And and away we go. Uh, maybe a pharmacist isn't, isn't all that bad an idea, given drug shortages and the like. Uh, we've showed these counties that ended up getting their own funding and developing their own systems in parallel. Uh, but counties became the focal point of EMS. Multiple interest groups formed and fed on the process of legislating and re-legislating the periodic extension of Wedworth, Wedworth Townsend. County by county regulation became institutionalized in California. And then, then we get Reagan in um, 80. Uh, Reagan as many will, will recall, was the, the great deregulator. Uh, early in 81, the, the Reagan administration put forth legislation that would end several categorical health programs. Uh, we, we may all remember dissolution of um, state psychiatric hospitals uh, occurred same time under Reagan, but also hidden in the uh, chopping block was EMS, replaced them with block grants to counties, uh, really solidifying the requirement for if you want an EMS system, you're going to have to do it largely at the county county level. Uh, and then in 81, same time, the federal EMS funding sort of fizzled out and states were, were on their own to, to figure this out. Uh, that sort of, I think, really sets the stage for where we are. Uh, it also exemplifies the differences that we see. Law enforcement was in place, really, uh, and, and fire in perpetuity were uh, solid pieces of both sort of federal, state, local government. But but EMS, you know, unfortunately, kind of an afterthought, and let's figure out ways to fund this along the way, and then let's pack, cut, slice. and um, And here we are with you know, if you've seen one EMS system, you've, you've seen one EMS system. 
So uh, there, therein lies the foundation for, for where we sit probably today. In the 80s, we really start seeing EMS look uh, much like it does now. EMS evolves in training and level of scope. Uh, the term uh, emergency medical technician was coined. Multiple levels were developed. Uh, we developed uh, specialized durable EMS equipment uh, specifically for that task. Although the golden era hour was a really... Uh, Quoted in the late 60s, uh, it became part of what we did and how we centered our trauma systems and centered and centers uh, in the 80s, uh, justifying what we do based on the golden hour. Uh, accred accredited largely, uh, here's another name, this and the um, 66 white paper, I think are two things worthy of uh, removing from this talk. R. Adams Cowley was the founder of the... Um, Maryland Shock Trauma Hospital, and really a, a landmark innovator. Uh, although he didn't necessarily study the golden hour, he recognized through, you know, decades of experience that the golden hour existed, uh, stated that basically there is a, a golden hour between uh, life and death. That was his original quote. Uh, this quote, I think, is even more interesting. He later called shock a momentary pause in the act of death, a process that once set in motion was irreversible. Uh, but Dr. Cowley's goal was to make it reversible. And now, as we recognize it, it is uh, more often than not uh, reversible. So uh, interesting headways in the in the 60s and all the way through the 80s. 90s, again, very similar to what we see now, development of uh, National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians and our EMT, evolution of public and private EMS, not necessarily working together, but, you know, there they are and, and not a lot's changed. We're, we're figuring things out still to this day. Progression of air ambulance in the 80s and 90s. Uh, first air ambulance was, again, back to our Dr. Cowley, Maryland shock trauma in 69, and that came uh, away from uh, Vietnam, who who did lots and lots of air ambulance transport to battlefield hospitals, so he uh, extrapolated that uh, that scope uh, to Maryland shock trauma, still managed by the Maryland State Police in that state. Two thousands uh, developed expanded specialized scopes of practice. We have flight paramedics, critical care paramedics, uh, not in our state but in other states, in hospital emergency department paramedics. And now we have well-defined uh, regulatory agencies coming to bear, as with all things, uh, when a, uh, a scope and a, a task becomes public, everybody wants control and oversight of that task. So there's grappling and battling or regulation and oversight. And, and here we see the results largely as they are currently. At a federal level, there's not really a lot of teeth. It's largely guidance, templates, recommendations, uh, but Department of Transportation, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is the federal agency to set the stage for EMS. Um, they are a great resource. They do amazing things. They also get to do a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, legal uh, leveraging with respect to uh, automobile safety, lots of politicking. Uh, they have a lot, a lot of power at, at those levels. At the state, California, we have a state-level EMS, uh, which is now delivered to us through, through two avenues. We have statute, health and safety code, division 2.5, and we have regulations, which are part of title 22, uh, chapter nine. I'm gonna show you that in just a second. I know you can hardly wait to see it. We have the California State EMS Authority, uh, which did glean significant oversight, guidance, and um, some degree of control. Uh, and then we have locally EMS agencies, known, of course, to all of us as the LEMSAs, uh, the powerhouse of EMS delivery uh, in California. So we talked about NHTSA. Here's their, their uh, branding federal organization, defines EMS titles and training. There are some federal statutes, and uh, they also end up allowing or aligning the, the guidance for our federal EMS providers. But uh, now to where the rubber meets the road in California, 
Uh, this is important, and we hear a lot about these two avenues by which uh, the law of EMS is delivered. Health and Safety Code is statute. It is where the bills and the language in the bills find their way, way directly into to, uh, printed law. So where, where we see statute, we see the uh, unchanged direct transition of the law to uh, EMS code. And then uh, the other half of the law or more is what we call the, the regulations that are delivered and derived from the statute. So Division 9 of Title 22, California Code of Regul Regulations, uh, is a 90-page single-spaced uh, document that uh, delivers to us a number of chapters I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, and really is the uh, the detail as to how EMS is delivered in California. Uh, what happens there largely is, just want to check time there, be sure we're doing all right, uh, and be sure everybody's got ample caffeine on board. Because it's going to get exciting here, folks, I'm, I'm telling you. Uh, so Division 2.5 established statewide system for emergency medical services, created the EMS authority to coordinate, oversee, monitor, and regulate. And statute defines the terms, describes the functions of EMS disciplines and what LEMSAs do. So it really sets the standards for training, education, scope of practice, et cetera. When we see the EMS laws and bills come to bear as we have so frequently, over the last you know, many years, but particularly last three to five years, lots of change in statute. That's going to be gradually uh, finding its way into regulation through all the uh, requirements that have to occur for regulation to be adopted. So here's regulation, uh, Title 22, Code of Regulations, uh, the Social Security Code, is the official compilation and pub publication of these regulations. They're compiled into titles, organized into divisions, properly adopted um, after they've been filed with the Secretary of State. Uh, there's a number of pieces that have to be approved before a regulation can be adopted. Otherwise, it may find its way to uh, becoming, a, quote, an underground regulation of which uh, EMSA has been called upon uh, I might add, under my administration, uh, it's possible that those underground regulations may have occurred before my tenure, but but I was uh, at the desk when, when the underground regulations piece came through and was found to be a, a true statement. So be careful in developing your regulations. Uh, it requires lots of specific intervention like public comments, often multiple public comments, approval by uh, HHS, approval by uh, uh, administrative law, uh, approval by the EMS commission, and then finally it's uh, advanced forward into uh, formal regulations. So here are our pre-hospital EMS. I know that seems redundant, but emergency medical services and statute and uh, regulation really refers both to hospital and pre-hospital. So here they carve it out. Division 9 is pre-hospital EMS. Here's the chapters that you'll find if you go there. Uh, the pertinent ones frequently sought after by, by many of us are these uh, chapters 1.5 through chapter 4. Those are the scopes of practice for the various levels of EMS delivered in California. Public safety, first aid, EMT, advanced EMT, and then chapter 4, uh, EMT paramedic regulations, which also holds a critical care paramedic and um, and flight paramedic, and that's where we'll ultimately find um, community paramedic as well. Uh, enough there. Uh, other areas of interest. Uh, this should be one that uh, you know all of us on the call are familiar with as we march through our our EMS jobs. Uh, Specifically looking at EMSA, California Emergency Medical Services Authority, the mission of EMSA is to ensure quality patient care by administering an effective statewide system of coordinated emergency medical care, injury prevention, 
and disaster medical response. Um, I'll just say out loud that an interesting chunk of this mission that always, I'll say, irked me was uh, the injury prevention piece is one that uh, IMSS is tasked with, but it's one that no one seems to really have the time or budget to take on. So I throw it out to this group so that we can keep that in the crosshairs moving forward. You know, we can save an awful lot more lives, trauma elsewhere uh, with prevention, you know, the ounce of prevention, panic cure piece, right? So that's EMS's mission. Responsibilities, largely coordination oversight. Um, they set pre-hospital care standards. They license paramedics and enforce paramedic licensure, although that's been uh, flexed a little bit. So with a couple of laws in the last few years, they approve EMS and trauma system plans from LEMSAs. Uh, they develop uh, regulation and systems. All of the um, time-sensitive emergency care has come through EMSA, and they're all uh, very similar to each other, EMS for children, stroke, STEMI, uh, trauma, uh, all specialty cares, and uh, sort of direct oversight by EMSA. Uh, poison control is a, a hidden little gem hiding in the coffers of EMSA. Kind of interesting, uh, uh, I guess EMS is one of those that's uh, tough for anybody to adopt, but poison control even more difficult for folks to adopt given they handed it to EMSA, but, but it ends up being a nice place for it to live at the end of the day. Uh, lots of other pieces. Disaster response is a big one. Obviously, uh, this one came to bear over the last uh, several years with our pandemic. The others were put in uh, sort of cruise mode as we as we figured that out. A couple of other little uh, red herrings here, public information education, daycare providers and bus drivers are hiding in there. The EMSA directorship uh, previously required a physician with significant EMS experience. That, as you all know, has just recently changed, uh, I think finalized two months ago now uh, with Liz Bassnett at the helm as the EMSA director, uh, no longer requiring a physician. Uh, with that uh, leniency on the on the directorship, they added a second position, which is a chief medical officer, and that acting is uh, Hernanda Garzon uh, from the Sacramento area. Uh, phenomenally talented gent. So seems like they have some good direction at the helm currently. Uh, and then we get into the meat of our EMS system. 34 local EMS systems are in play, uh, i.e. the LEMSA is where the rubber meets the road with respect to EMS systems. Uh, LEMSAs provide service to 58 counties in California. Uh, LEMSAs can be combined responsibility areas with multiple counties, or they can be single county uh, LEMSAs. There are seven regional LEMSAs comprising uh, 31 counties total, and there are 27 single county uh, LEMSAs, you know, as is San Diego, uh, totaling hopefully 58 if I if I did my math right there. Here's a map of what that looks like. Uh, this is available on the on the uh, EMS Authority uh, website. This is changing frequently because the LEMSAs are often changing. Single counties will pull out of multi-county. Uh, single counties will join multi-county. That changes these numbers around significantly. We currently sit at 34, as I mentioned. The uh, multicolored, uh, it's kind of top six or seven are the multi-county uh, uh, lumpses that you'll see. Uh, the one with the most counties is in, in my stomping ground up here. It's called SSV. I think they have 10 counties. Here we have the ISIMA group. Uh, and then the blue are the uh, single county entities. Uh, what does the org chart look like? Um, I guess this should all be dotted lines, given the org chart doesn't necessarily entail uh, lots of, of teeth in organization. Uh, nonetheless, this is the way it sort of sits in California. We have EMSA. We have the LEMSAs situated uh, beneath, but largely uh, delivering EMS to their regions. And then the, the LEMSAs, uh, delineate through policy, procedure, and other means uh, simply 
through California regulation and statute, uh, alignment, coordination, and uh, uh, control of these entities receiving hospitals in many situations, particularly the uh, time-sensitive emergencies, uh, base hospital coordination, providers, of course, that's where much of the, the time is spent, emergency medical dispatch uh, as well. Uh, there is some legislation that loosened this one up a little bit, uh, hiding out there uh, for something. And, and sorry, not enough coffee, I guess, because I'm drawing a blank on that assembly bill. Uh, underneath there, we have more of the participants in the EMS system. Again, the foundation of delivery for uh, care to our patients. Uh, not going to look at this in a lot of detail, but the, this is just a picture out of uh, 2.5 statute. We can find chapters and uh, sections, divisions, specifically delivering and delineating what the LEMSA shall do, uh, what EMSA shall do. And I think the takeaway for me, if you look at statute, is very short, concise, easy to read paragraphs. Uh, makes it uh, very simple to just sort of uh, realign uh, where responsibilities lie uh, in statute, and then the detail is more sort of curtailed uh, under uh, regulations. So here we are. We sit uh, with, you know, 34 LEMSAs in California. Uh, back to if you've seen one EMS system, you've seen one EMS system. Uh, the LEMSAs are all different. They all deliver EMS in a different way. I think there's huge value in that in California. As painful as our EMS system is, I don't know if there's anything we could do differently or better because we're, we're really, for all intents and purposes, a nation. We have a markedly disparate geography, even our urban centers, uh, markedly different, different capabilities, uh, different hospital capabilities, uh, EMS system capabilities. So that allows the LEMSA to mold and, and be flexible enough to deliver and uh, align EMS as fits best in that given region. So, um, you know, here's an example. LA County has a pre-hospital care manual approaching 461. Oh, wait, 462 pages. They just, I'm just kidding. They just added one. Uh, but, you know, tough to keep track of all that. Luckily, they they have an app for that, uh, as many of us do. Uh, multiple LEMSAs, EMSA, and stakeholder, stakeholders, uh, as we develop expertise and understanding, we, no surprise here, have conflicting interpretations of all the above. So, you know, this creates conflict. It creates push and strain. Uh, towards change in statute regulation. Those things are, I think, generally good things. We finally got community paramedicine after kind of a 10-year battle. Um, that, I think, was a toe-in-the-door piece we'll see here in just a minute. Uh, but it's it's getting better, as we saw, you know, with the Wedworth Townsend Act. Uh, more to come there. Uh, lots, lots of push-pull strain, argument, lawsuit, but we're, you know, we're figuring this out. Maybe maybe one day we'll we'll have it all figured out, or or maybe not. Uh, laws and local policy are often used as swords and shields. Different interpretations of uh, EMS law, regulation, and statute lead to uh, different actions from different stakeholders. Uh, interestingly, you know, we now have lots of new laws coming our way. We have a a law with regard to APOTs. Uh, coming our way, and lots of different interpretation as to you know what what are legal requirements for hospitals with respect to APOT. Some are, are delineated in this uh, assembly bill, some are not, and, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more conflict and strain uh, involved in in that law as time goes on. Uh, policies and law may specifically be in conflict, uh, frequently leading to to lawsuits. Um, and as we beat up regulations and, and the like, all vary markedly from county to county. Uh, back to uh, of why we're here. Uh, U.S. medical emergency statistics are more impressive than, than ever. Uh, we are first in line to deliver care to all of these folks. It puts undue stress and strain 
on all healthcare delivery systems. Uh, and you know, I'll say, particularly at least in my opinion, uh, EMS seeing a, a huge brunt of this. So, 40 million visits to emergency departments, two million hospitalizations. Here we get into deaths, uh, more and more impressive, 150,000 deaths from trauma, and this is you know annually in the U.S. 400,000 deaths from from heart attacks, half of that from strokes. Now the big two additions or a big two extrapolations uh, in 2022, 240,000 deaths from COVID, and this one up and coming, hence, uh, you know, additional uh, intervention, even from EMS with buprenorphine and, and other things, states everybody is on this bandwagon, 100,000 uh, deaths or more now from, uh, from drug overdose, uh, many very familiar to us in the fentanyl space, et cetera. So what do we do? You know, where do we go from here? Maybe this is the one slide that may meet the criteria for um, for data-driven practice, as this uh, lecture is supposed to be. Uh, what about the future of EMS? You know, we're we're getting things together. Uh, we're slowly figuring out. Okay, hopefully, it's coming back. Sorry. Christy, are you still hearing me? I still hear you, but I don't see the slide. I believe that's your last slide, so we should be pretty- Oh, that's funny. Okay, well, perfect timing, right? Um, okay, I'm just gonna comment on the last slide. Uh, don't kick the doc plug while you're you know, giving your lecture. I think that may be the biggest moral of this lecture. So what do we do with the future of EMS? We're being called upon to fill numerous gaps in in care delivery in general. Uh, when hospitals, primary physicians can't take care of folks, they back up, you know, into the EDs, they back up into EMS, they back up lots of different places, and, and we're seeing that. We're trying to take those on through lots of intervention, community paramedicine. We have triage to alternate destinations. We have maybe under the under the tab of triage to alternate destination, we also have new systems that allow patients to be dealt with in new ways like nurse navigation or tele-911. Um, all of these pieces and gap fillers are in play. They're being expanded, extrapolated, and figured out. Um, hopefully, they will help take care of patients and deliver care uh, in the best way, best place, um, and most appropriate uh, means, but uh, much of that has has yet to be figured out. So, you know, what else is coming our way? Uh, who exactly knows? But uh, now you would normally see a, a question mark slide. And back to you, we, Dr. We K. I hope we did okay on, yeah. on time. We can because you told us we have to do disaster functions. So we had a backup, and we have displayed your slides for you. <laughs> That is awesome disaster response. Look how well that works. Oh my yeah, goodness. That was an illustration that was all planned. So, so thank you, Dr. Duncan, very much for a fascinating uh, lecture and talk looking at the, the history of EMS. Good to remember that EMS was initially in place just to transport people to hospitals, right? Or to doctors and how far we've come since then and all the twists and turns of uh, Really, really amazing. I will open it up for questions now, and I have a couple if nobody else does, but if you have a question, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. I don't see any in the chat at this point. And I'm not seeing any hands. So while people are thinking of questions, let me ask you, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges facing EMS in California today? Thank you, Dr. K. I, boy, up, up close and personal, right? We're absolutely seeing those things in our county and in seems like every county. Uh, I think that the two pressures are essentially uh, choking EMS. We have uh, less and less healthcare provisions overall. We have more and more pressure funneling into the EMS system. Uh, you know, we're delivering primary care in our emergency departments. 
And uh, unfortunately, it just balloons, expands, extrapolates the need for EMS. Uh, but the same pressures apply to us. We're having more and more trouble getting uh, EMS providers to deliver care. Even the big systems are having difficulty, uh, you know, filling the employment coffers in spite of, you know, large bonuses, et cetera. We see decreased numbers of uh, EMS personnel entering the uh, EMS education system for both EMTs and paramedics. Uh, I really hope that changes and starts transitioning back to uh, enticing folks back into the EMS space. But, uh, you know, COVID, uh, I think, wreak, wreaked havoc on the healthcare system. And we're, we're seeing the, uh, the, the, sort of uh, inklings of that uh, remaining on and, and who knows for how long. Excellent points. Uh, let me ask you another easy question. <laughs> what do you think of the role of AI in EMS? How, how might that affect uh, EMS going into the future? That is, uh, you are talking to an analog guy, obviously, if my lecture fails on my next, next to the last slide. Uh, uh, there's probably someone on the call better slated. I mean, it seems to work well. We're seeing it in, in every aspect of what we do. Uh, maybe less so in medicine. Physicians, I think, are overall reluctant. We've seen computer programs along the way try and make diagnoses. And we've seen what happens when our patients dive into Google Care and bring that to us in, in the emergency department. So, uh, you know, I would be a little personally hesitant, but I'm sure they're going to figure it out in short order, and hopefully it'll be another gap filler for us. Um, I, I, I'd love to hear your perspective, Dr. K. What, what do you think on that one? I think we need to watch it very closely, and I think it's going to create a lot of changes, uh, but I'm a bit cautious because AI can make things up that sound really good, so I think we have to be very careful about that. Let me ask if there's any other comments to that or any other questions. Uh, Dr. Khan, did you want to ask a question? Your comment in the chat? Sure, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I see that. I, yeah, thank you, Dr. Khan. Asking if there's still a, a future for physicians in uh, California EMS. Absolutely. Um, you know, interestingly, and I'm sure, Dr. Khan, you were following, uh, occasionally when physicians fall out of favor in EMS, you end up with big, ugly uh, articles making the front pages of lots of journals and things. And that happened in, in Rhode Island, interestingly. Uh, the EMS services sort of took hold and ownership of, of EMS, largely pushing the medical directors aside, and they had uh, sort of some disastrous airway management outcomes with untoward deaths, uh, lots of uh, very low level success rates. And uh, and, and we see that in uh, sort of multiple instances. Uh, that said, luckily, uh, both statute and regulation hand an awful lot of responsibility to both the, uh, you know, the medical director of the LEMSA, uh, the base hospital physician. And what I see surprisingly is we don't tend to, at least in my experience, we don't tend to see providers push back too badly on medical uh, direction. So they tend to, I think, generally honor the, the medical director and the need for medical control and medical oversight. So hopefully that continues to bear uh, and folks aren't able to curtail the, the statute and regulation to take the physician out of the mix. Um, some degree of care could be continued, but uh, I think the quality improvement and assurance, uh, I think the specific policies, training, and education would, uh, would see a, a detriment there. I may have missed a question in the chat. There is another question from Albert at Verona Fire. Do you see EMS taking on a bigger role in patient triage in the future? Um, patient triage in the future. 
I'm not sure. Let's see. Um, oh, I see. Maybe broadly, uh, triaging patients. I mean, I think we have an immense place for patient triage. Currently, the triage of our EMS patients is aligned largely through the policies and procedures that the LEMSA and and state, you know, have to have to provide. So I think we are the definitive source for uh, patient triage. Uh, but if we're talking about patient triage in a bigger sense, you know, could community paramedics end up growing and something, you know, along that line and finding a way to filter patients of all sorts, not just EMS patients? Um, oh, I see. You're saying patient navigation. Yes. Yeah, that that's what I was sort of understanding. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe this is one of those build it and they will come pieces because no one else is necessarily taking this on. If they are, we're seeing more and more limitations to those kinds of systems built into our, our local counties and our, our local sort of primary care response. The tools aren't necessarily there. Therefore, you know, EMS may largely take on much of this patient navigation, patient triage. I hope I'm answering that question. I'm not exactly sure if I hit on that. I think it goes into community paramedicine and some of what we there as well. Albert, did we answer your question or do you want to come off mute and explain more? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you answered my question. Um, uh, I never, the term patient navigation kind of makes sense. Uh, I was just thinking in terms of, you know, we can't control who shows up to the emergency rooms, but we can certainly control who we take uh, as far as uh, EMS is concerned. Um, I just know this th This is like a very touchy subject. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really good point. And I think going through all the legislation helps frame that a little bit to understand in what circumstances paramedics are authorized to provide patient care. So that's why we're looking at developing these new systems like the alternate destination piece of community paramedicine, for example, to, to enable uh, our field professionals to use their good judgment, uh, but still have something other than just somebody signing out AMA, which isn't good for the patient or anybody else. You know, Usually they need something other than that emergency transport to the emergency department. They might even need to be seen in the emergency department, but not go by ambulance, for example. So I definitely think that uh, would be a future bigger role. Brad Schwartz, Dr. Schwartz, you have your hand up. Brad, Brad we may not there we go. be hearing you. Yes. How about now? Hello? Yep. Gotcha. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I was just <clears throat> thinking about the AI. Just want to make a short comment that I'm starting to see it creep into things like dispatch and nurse navigation or nurse triage and advice. And it'll eventually, I think, uh, get out to the field in the sense of what I would call co piloting, where the AI helps direct your thinking, direct your questions, direct your care by providing prompts and references that are pertinent. Yeah, we're, we're seeing AI attend our calls as well, taking notes, et cetera. It's, it's definitely uh, filtering into every avenue of our lives, it seems. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any more hands or questions in the chat and your timing is good. So again, thank you very, very much for that fascinating talk and we will end the lecture at this point. Thank you, Dr. K. Thank you, everybody.